Welcome to the North Cities YouTube channel. We hope you enjoy today's message. So good to be with you in your homes, automobiles, and everywhere, wherever you may be. So good to be with you. I want to take just a moment and, and thank this wonderful congregation. We have, we have adjusted to unexpected changes in one of the most amazing ways that I have ever, ever witnessed. This congregation is rallied together with prayer and, and supplication and, and reaching and touching each other and touching God and, and making sure that we stay in contact with each other. It's a beautiful thing, and I just want to say how much I love and appreciate North Cities. What a great place. Let me get to the lesson. In 1976, British astronomer Patrick Moore made an announcement on BBC Radio 2. He said this, at 9.47 today, there will be a once-in-a-lifetime astronomical event occurring. He said that listeners could experience it in their own homes. The planet Pluto would pass behind Jupiter, temporarily causing a gravitational alignment that would counteract and lessen the Earth's own gravity. Patrick told his listeners that if they jumped in the air at the exact moment that this planetary alignment occurred, that they would experience a strange floating sensation. After 947 had, had passed, Radio 2 began receiving hundreds of phone calls from listeners claiming they had felt that sensation. One woman even reported that she and her 11 friends had risen from their chairs and floated around the room. The date, April the 1st, 1976. Don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. You can be fooled by a lot of things, but the subject tonight is one that you do not want to get fooled by. And that is Psalm 14 begins like this. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable things. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They were all gone aside. They were all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge, who eat up my people as they eat bread, and call not upon the Lord? There, are, they, there were they in great fear. God is in the generation of the righteous. Ye, shall be, sh ye have shamed the counsel of the poor, because the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that salvation of Israel were come out of Zion. When the Lord bringeth back the captivity of his people, Jacob shall rejoice, and Israel shall be glad. Brother Johnny did a wonderful job introducing the big idea of this lesson. The fact of the matter is, we need God. We need God. We were never designed nor are we capable of being the managers of ourselves without God. We need God. The biggest chaos that can happen is trying to live life, become the architect of your own life without God involved in it. We cannot do it. We must have God. The introduction of this psalm takes us also to the 53rd psalm, which is almost identical to this one, so its contents are, are the same. And as we look at this psalm, the, the elements are both wisdom and prophetic in this psalm. They grant to us some insight of how the foolish live and what the consequences of that is. But it also is prophetic, saying out of Zion, out of Zion is going to come salvation. In the Old Testament, a fool is one who rejects the fear of God as the source of all wisdom. 
This use of the term fool differs, differs from the one found in Matthew chapter 5, verse 22, which means worthless. So when this writer is writing foolish and, and calls the man a fool that doesn't believe there is God, he's not referring to the same one in the New Testament. Let's read together again the first three verses. Because in these thir- first three verses, we'll find the fool's godless confession that leads to evil results. He says, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable things, works. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. The fool confesses in his heart there is no God. This is what we refer to as practical atheism rather than intellectual atheism. Practical atheism is, results in, in us becoming evil in our deeds Practical atheism says it's all about self. It's about me. Though they may confess they believe in God, they live as though he does not exist. That's practical atheism. In this place of selfishness, we we replace the knowledge of God, and we replace it, and we lose meaning, direction, and purpose in doing so. We also create a moral cancer through this unbelief. May I take a moment to, to awaken us to the reality that, that selfishness is the enemy to serving God. Selfishness is like a cancer. It replaces, the, it dethrones God and it puts us up on the throne. We must bring ourselves into subjection to God. One of the great lessons that Jesus talks to us about is dying. He talks to us about humbling ourselves. If you want to be exalted, become abased. He talks to us about the deconstruction of this selfish idea that we are so important and that we are the ones that, that really everything should be about me. You see, the Lord looks on humanity, however, and he, does, he doesn't give up on us. But he extends grace. He's benevolent. He gazes at us as a God that was seeking for us, even in our unbelief. Even in the times whenever we are caught up in our selfishness, God is still in quest for us. He's still looking for us. He's still reaching for us. And he's trying to sober us up from the intoxication of selfish ideas and and this thing that we become our own God. You see, here it is that we find this overwhelming evidence of God all around us. And we can see God everywhere. We recognize that he is there. But we must put it into shoe leather that we believe God exists by making him Lord of lords. We, he must become the king of all life. He must, we must surrender at the cross and become, become abased and say, God, it's not about me, but it's about you. The greatest life that we will ever live is a life that is in full surrender to the Lord and making him God. The next two verses read is thus. He says, Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge? Eat up my people as they eat bread, and call not upon the Lord. There were they in great fear. For God is the generation of the righteous. He says in verse 6, Ye shall shall shame the counsel of the poor, because the Lord is his refuge. In this verse Eugene Peter says it this way in in the message. He says, when he talks about the fear, they were in great fear. He says that the wicked will have a night that is coming full of nightmares. The NIV says it this way. The wicked will be overwhelmed with dread. 
While evildoers who function without the knowledge of God will suffer this fear or this overwhelming dread or this night that's coming with nightmares, he said, the Lord is with his people. The Lord is with his people. You see, living a life without God, living a life that is without the knowledge and without the living of God in us, we would we will go through tremendous fear, tremendous unrest. The greatest peace that comes to us is when we find ourselves in alignment with God. And when in alignment with God, he says, the Lord is with his people. He said of the evil, he said they have consumed the Lord's people like someone consumes just a slice of bread. While the evil, evil people suffer terror, the people of God will be at peace with God. God will take care of his people. While the evil try to consume them, God will be with them. They consider the wisdom of the poor as worthless. And this arrogance and rejecting God to those who follow him naturally bring about this fear or terror because the Lord is with his people. Let me say it again. The Lord is with his people. Amen. The Lord is with his people. Why don't you just say it? The Lord is with his people. Amen. He's with us. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. But we must recognize him and call upon his name, realizing he is God, and he is God of all. He's God of everything in my life. I surrender to him. Amen. You see, he has given to us peace joy and righteousness in the Holy Ghost, the Bible says in Romans chapter 14, verse 17. We have this peace and this joy and this righteousness. And in this kingdom that you and I live in, the Lord is with us. May I speak some peace into a home right now? The Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. You made him God. You surrendered to him, and he is your God, and the Lord is with you. No matter what terror may be around you, no matter what may shake around your world, the fact is the Lord is saying to the righteous, I am with you. I am with you. Don't fear. I'm there. I'm going to take care of you. Amen. I think sometimes we, because we live in such a visual world, and we, we use our, our senses to to measure everything, sometimes we fail to recognize that God is with us. And sometimes it's just a simple acknowledgement of him, just saying, God, I know you are with me. Just simply saying it, God, I know that you're with me. You're in my home right now. You're in my life. Amen. The next verse brings us to this. He says that the Lord... He says, Oh, that salvation of Israel were come out of Zion when the Lord bringeth back the captivity of his people. Jacob shall rejoice and Israel shall be glad. Israel shall be glad. This is a prophetic utterance of what is coming. The Lord is, is bringing refuge to his people. The righteous have God in their generations, and the Lord is their refuge. When the foolish seek to destroy them, the Lord's people pray for the future. Psalmist intercedes for the Lord's people rather than wallowing in despair. He knows his people will come out of Zion and the very dwelling place of God's Spirit. In the midst of trouble, in the midst of, of lamenting, he prays, and he says, Lord, I'm praying for the future of Israel. I'm praying for the future of Zion. In this time, you see the psalmist, he recognizes that there is hope. There is hope coming. We can trust in God. We can believe in him. We can, we can put our confidence in him and knowing that he is with us. He's with us. There have been times in my own life whenever I felt very overwhelmed and I've shared a number of stories through the years, but one of the, one of the first moments that I realized that God was with me, and I was, uh, my wife and I uh, 
just had gotten in church and been in church very long. In fact, I don't think she had yet received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But I had felt so rejected. Whenever I first got in church, I had no friends. It seemed as though I was just all by myself. And it seemed as though I, I, I was just lonely. I was troubled. It seemed as though I was uh, picking up rejection from all kinds of places, from the people I knew, the people I had known. And I borrowed uh, an album from someone, and you'll need some of you younger folks will probably want to Google this, but I, I borrowed an album, and I recorded it on a cassette tape player. Now, that's a cassette tape player. You'll, you'll need to Google that one. And, and I put it, put it on this cassette tape, and I had a cassette tape player in my 72 Chevrolet Vega, which was bright orange. And all the car had was an AM radio. And so I was driving down the road, feeling all sorry for myself, wallowing in despair somewhat, and wondering, where is God? Where is God? And all of a sudden, I heard the tape player click. And I thought, you can't push that button just accidentally. You had to take your thumb and put on it and push it. And all of a sudden it clicked. And a song came on by Merle Ewing. And it sang, he's more than a friend to me. And when that song came on, I couldn't help it. But I, I just let go of the steering wheel. And I wouldn't recommend this to anybody. But I let go of the steering wheel and I lifted my hands and I started just weeping and thanking God for his presence and realizing that God was with me. God was there. When I came to, the little car was still between the white and the yellow and I, I realized, God, thank you for watching over this guy, <laughs> this, uh, this fellow that may be a little brain dead at times. Thank you for watching over me. And I, I remember from that moment on, recognizing the fact that God is with me. God is there. He never leaves me. He never forsakes me. He's always there. The psalmist, the psalmist is so, so quick to tell us that God is there and that there's a future. There's a future coming that has even more hope. The Lord will bring complete deliverance to his people, and he said they will rejoice and be glad. This is a tremendous insight and a tr as well as a tremendous prophecy of what is coming, insight of what is coming down the road, what is it going to happen. Let's, let's look at this psalm and application for a moment. First of all, Paul quotes the 14th psalm as evidence of his conclusion that Jews and Gentiles and all people are sinners far away from God. He quotes it in Romans chapter 3, verse 10 through 12, where he says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. We're all in need of God. Everyone is in need of God. None of us can save ourselves. None of us can pull ourselves out of the troubles. None of us can, t can deliver ourselves from transgression. None of us can rise up and, and become our own God. It's proven over and over through time. Nobody can become their own God. Next, we see that we live in the time when this prophecy has come to pass. We live in a time when God has brought salvation out of Zion. With the rip veil, the Holy Ghost came pouring out, and Zion was glad and rejoiced. Zion in Israel was glad and rejoiced, because out of your belly shall flow a river of living water. This spake he of the Spirit, that they that believe on him, De, don't deny there's not a God, but believe on him. He said, out of their bellies will flow a river of living water. This spake he of the Spirit, that they that believe on him should receive. And we have received it. On the day of Pentecost, God poured out his Spirit. The rushing mighty wind 
filled the atmosphere. And suddenly, out of nowhere, the power of God fell upon the people and they began to speak in a heavenly language. And the prophecy spoken in this text was brought to pass. Suddenly, they were rejoicing. They were they so caught up, the crowds around them thought they were intoxicated. And Peter said, no, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, that in the last days God would pour out his spirit, and this is it. And when they were pricked in their hearts after Peter was talking to them in dialogue, they said, what do we need to do? And Peter said, here it is. You need to repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. This is the fulfillment of this prophecy. You, as, as we look, the Holy Ghost, we, we embrace that God is and that He lives in me. When we receive the Holy Ghost, that's what we do. We acknowledge that God is. We recognize that He does exist. We acknowledge that He is God and that He is now living in me when He, he fills us with the Holy Ghost. As believers, we live in a world where God still gives space for unbelieving, foolish people to repent. He said, Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. He still gives room for us to repent. We're called, we're called to repent and surrender. Surrendering ourselves to God and saying, God, I belong to you. I'm giving myself to you. I'm no longer trying to be my own God, but I am surrendering to you. And in this world where we, he gives us this grace, we yield to him. We give to him. Jacob is rejoicing. Israel is glad. And we worship and rejoice while we await a final deliverance. A final deliverance. We have been delivered. He whom the Son has set free is free. But this isn't the final deliverance. We still, we still toil. We still work against things. And things work against us. We still daily must make the decision, God is going to be God of my life. We still are here struggling in this flesh. But there is a final deliverance that's coming. The, the Bible says this, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that they which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. This next verse I really like. He says, Wherefore comfort one another with these words. I have hope. I have hope. <laughs> I have received the earnest of mine inheritance. The, the infilling of the Holy Ghost. But that's just the down, that's just a, a, a taste of it. That's just a little portion of it. But one day the dead in Christ are going to rise and we will be caught up together to meet him in the air and so shall we ever be with him. Why don't you lift a hand right where you are and say, I have hope. Thank you, Lord, for the hope that lies within me. Thank you for the hope not only that lies within me, but the hope that I have in you. That even now, even now, I rest in that hope. Even now, I rest in the hope that you are in me and that you are going to translate me from this life to that life. Oh, thank you for it, Lord Jesus. Thank you for it. Thank you for the hope that we have. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. We have hope. And so the fool says, there is no God. But you and I, you and I on this side, oh, hallelujah, we have hope because we, our trust is in God. Our trust is not in ourselves. Our trust is not in the things that we have. Our trust is not in the, in the economy. It's not in the world, but our, tr- our trust and hope is out of this world. Amen. It's out of this world. I was talking to a fellow minister a few days ago, maybe a week ago now. We were talking about how fear grips people. And that's what the Bible says would happen to the wicked, that fear would grip them. We were talking about how fear oftentimes grips people. But to us who have faith, we're not living just for right now. Much of fear comes from the fear of leaving this planet. Much of fear comes from the death. But the early church was not afraid of death. Paul said, To be absent from you is to be present with the Lord. He wasn't afraid of it because he had hope. Perhaps this is a good time to lift our eyes from here. This horizontal look and look look up and say, Lord, I'm looking to you. I am resting in you. You hold everything in my life. You hold my present and you hold my future. And God I'm going to make you Lord. I want to make you God. I'm going to acknowledge you in all of my ways. And I'm going to put my trust in you. Proverbs 3, 5 through 7. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And lean not unto thine own understanding. And in all thy ways acknowledge him. And he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord. And depart from evil. That summarizes this psalm. The admonition is to trust in the Lord. The psalmist lays it out so that we can see the, the, the destruction and the, the pain of evil. And then he ends it, this psalm, with this ray of hope and this brightness of God that Israel will rejoice and be glad. One more time, join with me. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your presence that's so powerful to me. I thank you for your guiding hand. I thank you for watching over all of us. I pray that during this time that you would lift all anxieties and fears. Let the peace of God flood through every home and every every life. And Lord, I pray that you would bring a calm to us, knowing that our trust is not in the things of this world, but our trust is in you. We trust you today. We open our heart with faith, and we say, Lord, we trust you, and we thank you for the hope that lies within us. We ask it all by the power of your word. By the power of the blood that you have shed that's redeemed us. And by the power of your great and glorious name. In Jesus' name. We hope that today's message blessed you. If it did, like this video and subscribe to our channel to see more videos like this. You can also connect with us at our website, northcities.org, or follow us on the social media channels listed below. God bless.